So as Sergio said, we're live from a, a vaccinated room uh, in Santa Clara. And again, I want to thank uh, Federico for being with us. Uh, we were talking before uh, about this being the 50th anniversary of microprocessor and you being the pioneer of that. Um, I was wondering if you could take us through from uh, your your hometown of Vicenza and your studies in, in Padua, how you ended up at coming to SGS Fairchild. Right. Um. So I was born in 1941, uh, wartime. Um, after a year and a half, my father decided to move to a small, to a village, Isola Vicentina, because uh, the Allied forces were coming through Sicily and they were soon to be in the north. So I spent my first six years after that, after, you know, so from from one and a half to seven and a half in a rural uh, village uh, where basically in many homes there were not even electricity. Uh, they, you know, the uh, farmers were still using plows with, uh, you know, pulled by by oxen. oxen yeah. I mean, just an unbelievable, you know, uh, unbelievable when you think about it, with the eyes of today, but so anyway, so I, I experience uh, how people live 200 years ago and uh, my first language was the Venetian dialect, uh, uh. so which I still speak very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, as long with, uh, also with English. Yeah, 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 yeah but no, Ita uh, next was Italian. <laughs> 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 but in fact, the first the first day of school, uh, um, uh, I, I, I understood half of what the teacher was was, was, was talking because uh, everybody speaks dialect in, yeah. in the village. Yeah. So, you know, Italian was a new language for me. So I had to learn that one first. Anyway, so uh, uh, I grew, you know, then we moved back to Vicenza where I was born, where my father was a professor of philosophy and uh, history at, at uh, Liceo Classico and also University of Padua scholar. My father uh, wrote about 40 books, uh, translated the uh, Enneads of Plotinus uh, uh, and wrote about many philosophers, uh, especially, especially I idealist philosophers like Schopenhauer, Meister Eckhart, so on. So uh, I grew up in a in a home that was quite culture. My, my mother was uh, uh, elementary school teacher. But I, I didn't care about that stuff. I really, uh, my, my first love was model planes and uh, I decided to, I, I saw one when I was 11 and that's it, was love at first sight. So I had to build myself one and then two and then three and so I still build them and fly them. Um, and, uh, uh, but I had no money so I had to figure out how to, you know, how to design them and make make them and uh, I bought a book, first book I bought with my money um, and uh, and I was self-taught essentially except for the book and uh, that was a fundamental experience because he, he essentially gave me a 12 an experience of how you actually build a product because the product you first you imagine it then you had to draw it figure out you know, a plan, you make a plan, then you buy the material, then you construct it, then you assemble it, and then you fly it from A to Z yeah. at 12. <clears throat> in fact, I never had any trouble de designing anything yeah. because that experience gave me the entire 360 view of how you build products. You have to manage every aspect, every of, aspect that. of it. You have to yeah. master but it. But it all comes from the mind. Yeah. It all comes from that, you know, moment of imagination where you now then it becomes you know a the first trans transfer from consciousness into drawing which is you know, some memory on paper and then from there it becomes physical yeah. so that that process is the process of invention um i i went to a technical high school uh to the chagrin of my father who of course wanted me to study the, the, classical I see, but I couldn't care less yeah. about Latin. Yeah. <laughs> so, and even less about Greek in those days. <laughs> and, uh, 
and so um, so uh, I graduated the best of the institute by a long shot. But the point is that right after I went to work for Olivetti, when mm. Olivetti was a major force in office systems and computers, they had uh, announced in 1959, they announced their first uh, uh, transistorized computer at the same time as IBM had the first transistorized computer. So uh, they were fairly advanced for, for, for those days um, compared to the, to, to the US. And I work in Borgo Lombardo. I started in 1960, end of 90, toward the end of 1960, and I spent the entire 1961. And I was lucky enough to uh, be given a project that eventually became my project to design and build a small experimental computer about the size of, say, the, the, the 4004 and all the memories around it and so on. So about that, that much. And I did that. Uh, I did about 60% of the design and build the entire thing. I had four technicians working for me, all older than me. So, so instead of a plane, it became a, a, a mini computer. It yeah. became, it became, a, it basically, it was, it, it was, it, it would, it would have, it was the equivalent of a much faster cal calculator, programmable calculator, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, but it was a general purpose computer, but, it, but the, the intention was to have a, you know, a fast cal calculating machine. Oh and to see how that would work. So anyway, so that project then, uh, after that project, I decided that it was time for me to go back and study study physics. And, and you were 19 or 19, So 1961, okay. and, yeah, yeah. and yeah. then in 1961, so I, I left. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I just turned, I just turned 20 uh, in, in December. So um, so I decided to go back to, to go to university, University of Padua, and I wanted to study physics because I, I, you know, I study, I study vacuum tubes at the technical high school. Transistors were fairly new in, in 1960. I, I uh, you know, and this, this schools are always five, five or 10 years late in terms yeah. of what they teach with respect to what is the forefront of technology. And of course, transistors in those days were still very slow compared to vacuum tubes. You know, germanium transistors, they, they had a, cut off frequency of, you know, about a megahertz. So, I mean, you know, that or, or a few megahertz. So it, it took silicon to really go the next, yeah. the next leg. Um, and um, so the, uh, uh, so I, I decided though that that was the future. And it was very clear to me that was the future. So I wanted to understand quantum physics, understand how the transistors really work, not just using it, you know, but how does it work? Yeah. And uh, and so I went I, I went I did physics instead of engineering, which would have been the more natural thing for me to do, and uh, I never regretted having done that because that was really a, 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 a you know gave me some so, so solid a foundation of uh, mathematics and physics that that you know I could do anything uh, after that of, of technical nature. So um, after graduation, I went. To work for a small company for for uh, less than a year, and then I, I ended up in 1967 at SGS Fairchild. Mm. So uh, it was uh, May of 19, 1967 when when I started, and uh, uh, with the earlier company called Ceres, I, they sent me in Silicon Valley in the summer of '66 to learn MOS transistors because this company had the rep. They were a rep of general micro, uh, general microelectronics. It was the first MOS company in the world, mm. starting I think in 60, 65 or early 66. And, uh, and they, they had developed a hundred bit shift register. Can you imagine a <laughs> hundred bit? They couldn't build it, but they, had, yeah, but they were. Yeah, they were, this was the they were, yeah, that was. <laughs> And so, so, um, so, uh, so I, I spent a week uh, here uh, with a course on MOS and uh, the products of this company, and, and then I went back. But then, then uh, GME was purchased by Philco Ford. That they disappear, and so my job there disappeared. So I went to SGS, and SGS Virtual uh, had just started a R and D uh, facility. In those days, SGS uh, was uh, the uh, European 
licensee of bipolar tran bipolar transistors and integrated circuits from Fairchild. Yep. Fairchild had about 30% ownership of the company, um, and uh, uh, but they were dependent on products from Fairchild, and so they uh, they decided in early 67 or late 66 to start an R&D uh, facility. I joined them. In my first job, since I knew everything about MOS, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> was to <laughs> was to develop their first MOS process technology, which I did. Yep. I did uh, in about four months, and then I designed two integrated circuits uh, before the end of the year. Uh, one was a 16-bit static shift register, which you know, which it takes a lot more transistors than a dynamic one, and uh, um, and uh, uh, and then a, a, a sort of a, a sort of a gate array with metal that you could design your own. You know, you know, of course, there were only a few gates. They probably, I don't know, they were probably the equivalent of 20 gates or something, you know, maybe you know, maybe 40 gates, but, right. you know, but that kind of thing. Uh, and that was the, you know, that that takes us to the end of, uh, to the end of uh, uh, 67. And then I was sent here for, you know, in an exchange of engineers in early, in February of uh, 68, here in Silicon Valley. Here in Silicon Valley to work uh, in the R&D facility of, uh, of Fairchild. And, uh, and so that, I told you my first life. Yeah, the first exactly. life in Italy, you know, and now we are at the beginning of my, my second life.